in some instances it is an offense. And I want to ask, how exactly can you approach this topic and still be sensitive to the, to the struggle of black America um, in regards to slavery, civil rights, Jim Crow, everything? I once had a gentleman swiftly tell me that he was not African. And I had to respect that because he told me he's American just like any other person. He's American just like any white American because of his struggles here. His mother, grandmother, gr great grandmother were from Alabama. So I respect that. Uh, myself, I was born in Sudan. I'm, my parents are both from Ethiopia. So now I have to balance being first generation American, trying to connect to people here because that is my identity and still connecting to Africa. I've been to Ethiopia three times and it's a beautiful experience. Okay. So I, I'm asking you exactly how can we approach that conversation while still respecting and being sensitive to the struggle? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. Um, <laughs> look at it. <laughs> Uh, now, I'm, of course, I think people, we have to use some tact when, you know, people can get very passionate. The responses you get are not responses that we don't get either, even if you are quote-unquote African-American. I imagine it probably is harder if you're not, if somebody's that, uh, you know, rapidly anti, then they, they will take more of offense. But if you are, then it makes it easier. Um, I, I think, um, hmm. So usually when I'm uh, discussing it with somebody, maybe that's the, the difference because I, I'm be considered what it is considered African American, so I can challenge it and and, uh, and be comfortable with it. But I think it is necessary to be challenged in battle of ideas. You have to pick your battle sometimes or just leave some people alone. But then it's also about how we uh, how we able to encapsulate or describe the common situations here. Um, when people talk about building, you know, America and all that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. One one of the things that I talk about that I say that uh, makes me African and is a, uh, is a humanism and a respect for land. Land is the basis of freedom for all people, as Malcolm X taught us. And sometimes you refer to people like Malcolm X, and people respect Malcolm X. If we respect that, then we have to respect that this land belongs to some other people. Right? And so, and if we are, in, and I, you know, usually I've used an analogy, so if I'm in a house, if somebody, um, kidnaps me from my house, and they take me to another house, and, and a house that they don't, doesn't belong to them, and they take the residents of that house, or the people that house belong to them, lock them in the closet, and make me build this house, and do all kind of you know, things to renovate this house, and then they keep the other people in the closet, and give me some nominal freedom, and allow me to you know, live in the house. Whose house is it? Uh, that, that's the question. So what, does that make this house belong to me? You know, now, it really doesn't make the answer to your question any, but it, it takes uh, a long time to be able to exercise this in, in anything when we're struggling with our people and all kinds of questions. It takes practice and it takes us to be able to study the ins and outs of all of these dynamics <coughs> and these ideas that we're supporting. So the, you know, the real answer is that it takes time and to also vigilance and don't back off just because somebody, I mean, the reason why people believe that they're Alabama and all that kind of stuff, this is not ideas, they think that they thought of these ideas for themselves, but it's instilled in us, you know, people are made to think that we're, we're American and that we're this and we're that. In fact, maybe a lot, and one approach could be to ask people questions uh, about their ideas and, you know, make sure you're humble and with no respect, but what makes you an American? If it's just building, then this analogy here uh, just counts, you know, slaves, people enslaved build a whole lot of things. <clears throat> and we, there was also slavery in Africa, you know. And so we can go to the parallels, the things that they're identifying here that they think make them American are really the same thing that make them Africans, you know. And so, yeah, um, Dr. Miller, did you how did you account for the uh, pre-colonial presence, the, you know, the oral tradition that there was a pre-colonial presence of Africans in the Americas? Did you take that into your into consideration? Um, I know that that's definitely a, a facet of, of the realities. Um, I haven't necessarily engaged it thoroughly um, yet, but it will definitely be ingrained inside the work as I move, as I transition towards book. But I do engage on kind of pre-diaspora relations in three different spaces. So one is the, the indigenous colonial encounter, um, the Moors in, in relationship to um, Catholics, Iberians, so precursor to Spain, um, and then the dynamics of what happened on the continent in West Central Africa prior to the initiation of the transatlantic slave trade. 
Again, if you could introduce yourself <coughs> and identify the panelists. Yes. Hi, yes, my name is Al Hall for Peel Incorporated. Dr. Janak. Uh, and this is very, very serious. I mean, this is real and very, very serious. You all know about it. I'm sure some of the panelists know about it. That's land grab. So we talk pan Africanism, they talk pan landism, <laughs> meaning the Europeans, uh, Asians, the Chinese, you know the Chinese are in Africa. Uh, 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 UAR, the e Egyptians, uh, the Arabs, you know, they are buying up the land. It's plain and simple. You know, we call ourselves African and uh, having a motherland, but we don't own it. I mean, I got, you know, I got the figures. I did the research on it, you know. I mean, between one and five million hectares of land is being leased by these folks who are not African. They're there to, as you know, agri for agricultural production and export. Export. <laughs> so how, how can we as pan Africanists, what are we going to do? Why, how are we going to deal with this? This is real. Because we can talk, we've been having, we've been having a pan African conference for the past hundred and some years. Well, we need to take some action about no, no, this. Good question. There is, yeah, yeah, question. Uh, there is, there is an online petition to, there is an online petition to deal with this. I can talk to you more about it. Yeah, before yeah. I want to I, I, I think maybe you want to say something about that. Or you want to ask a question? Or you want to answer or you want to ask a question? Yeah, but you want to answer a question. Nefa, I'm letting Nefa to answer because Nefa is uh, a. Yeah, Nefa, can you talk about the land issue? Go, go on. Get that to where I'm going to address it. Look, I think um, man, as Malcolm X talked about, land is the basis of all. All, uh, liberation and sustenance for everything that comes from the land. But if we're really talking about, we have to have the reason why people, uh, other people and other or from other nations and whatnot are able to come into Africa or anywhere and acquire land through buying it is because of neocolonialism. These neocolonial puppets are, subs are subscribing to the same laws around land and whatnot um, as, as the global order. So we got to, uh, one, and so, and we also don't want to fall into the trap of also uh, uh, acquiring land and utilizing in the same fashion and manner um, that, that, uh, that capitalists do. Land should not be the property of individuals. It's the sustenance of the people. And so we have to overthrow these <laughs> neocolonialism in Africa and utilize the land and apply it for the masses of the people. This is what socialist projects are. If, since you opened it up, I want to, I want to, uh, I want to still address this if I have a time about socialism. I, I think I would, I would have Contend, have contention with the fact that so, the, the, the assertion that socialism has failed um, because uh, socialism has no more failed than it has our continued and ongoing uh, struggle to get rid of the bourgeoisie and, and, and the class that's actually controlling the global economy and the global order. I mean, if to say that it's failed is to say we are finished in, in that struggle. Uh, socialism doesn't is not in conflict with Ubuntu or any of the communal. Socialism really should be looked at as inclusive, as, as another way. We can we can call things different words if we want to. That's not really the point. But what we're struggling for is the essential features, the essential characteristics that the commun and communalism embodies, and applying them in a modern industrial context. That's what socialism is. And so it's no more failed than it is our than it is our struggle continues to get rid of capitalism and overthrow. Um, the, uh, the domination by a few um, over property and labor and whatnot. But, um, so that's, anyway, that's my Thank answer. You. Can I just add one thing? Yes. Um, I would also say that the one example we do have of a socialist state being Cuba, it's only been in existence for 56 years. And if we look at the spectrum of how human processes work and societies work, it takes 100 years and more four generations for just one aspect to become taken for granted in a social order. So. Keep in mind, too, that the United States has been systematically um, sabotaging this socialist project from its inception. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I can't say that it's it's failed because it really hasn't had a fair shot. Melvin? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. First, uh, let me say that uh, I came here out of curiosity. You know, I uh, saw the program and I said I wanted to come and see what the the thinking is about pan-Africanism going forward. Uh, I can say that uh, it's real complex, uh, what I see. Um, the, I operate in a world close to the U.S. policy toward Africa. 
I've, I've been heavily involved in the trade policy of GOA, um, the Young African Leaders Initiative. I wrote the concept paper for that. Um, HIV AIDS legislation, Ron Dellum was my chairman. And we got the U.S. government to commit $15 billion for HIV AIDS uh, in Africa. We're heavily involved in the Ebola fight, <coughs> efforts to uh, strengthen healthcare infrastructure in Africa. I'm confused. Uh, first of all, everybody's from Africa, you know. So when you think about the Pan-African struggle, the reality is everybody is from Africa. That's a reality, you know. Um, and the second thing I would say, uh, what I'm missing in the whole conversation is a whole discussion about strategy. I can say that in the world that I operate in, there are people who are well-funded, well-financed, who are working every day to make sure that this don't, don't move forward. Uh, there are efforts to divide African Americans and African immigrants. Uh, yeah, people are funded to do this, and I, I fight it every day, you know. And I fight it with the State Department, I fight it with the White House, I fight it in Congress. Um, you know, and so I guess I would like to hear more about what is the actual strategy, you know. How do we actually um, organize? as opposed to agonize, you know? <laughs> How do we actually organize? And uh, to me, that costs money. It costs uh, money to do town hall meetings. It costs money to do telecommunications. It costs money to use uh, uh, infrastructure. And so I want to know from Brother uh, Uncle Naka, <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what is the absolute strategy? Let's get Uncle Naka and also Dr. Clark okay. to address the okay. strategy, connecting the dots, moving forward. How do we get it done? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, friend over there, I wanted to pass the question to my friend Letra and Alexandra because as I, you know, I wanted to be fair because I've spoken a little bit more than them. You know, that's why I didn't want to address your question. But uh, we can continue the conversation after this meeting and we take your information. That's something we look at in our research. Okay, thank you very much for your understanding. Now, uh, yeah, big brother, uh, Melbourne Foods. Uh, we hear that often, you know, what is your strategy? You, know, right. you hear in America, you just talking, organizing conferences, you know, what do you do on the ground? Right. I hear that often. Uh, Sometimes when I hear that, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I, I do not know how to answer the question. Yes, to be honest with you. Not because the question is difficult, because I do not know how to answer the question. So the question is this, what did Dr. King do? What did he do when he was alive? Malcolm X, what did he do? They were talking and organizing. But before you organize, you talk. You sensitize, you mobilize people. You want people to understand and to rally behind your idea. That's what we're doing. So the way what we're doing is part of the strategy. That's, uh, that's the, the first thing people should understand. We, it's not that we have money to waste, or that we don't have. That we, it's not that we don't have any other thing to do, but we want to emulate Nkrumah, Dubois, uh, everything they did was. It is because of what they did. That's why we here. We can talk about Pan Africanism. It was difficult for them. It is more difficult. It was more difficult for them than for us today. This is one thing. But teach, share, organize, speak, elevate the consciousness. Second thing. That, uh, that is very important, is that we have to take advantage of the new inventions. We are we here in this room, this beautiful room, talking about Africa, and uh, in the 60s, in the 50s, in the beginning of the 20th century, it was difficult for our people. Sometimes people were not even giving them the visa to go from place to place. Today, we can organize webinars. And we are doing that. Maybe, maybe you don't, many people do not, but we're doing that, doing webinars, connecting people from Switzerland to, to Canada, to the US, to, to Africa. We are, this is what we do in our space, but we want to see many people doing that on a regular basis. It's not just, like I said, it's not just our small group, uh, and as a group, I'm not talking about the financial response, but I'm talking about Friends of Congo, IPS, and PACA. It, it is when we become many together, doing the same thing that, that the European, we know that we mean business. Second thing, we have to take advantage of all this Facebook and YouTube and, and so and so, you know, to try and promote, you know, that Pan-African vision. It is part of the strategy we're doing. We need to do more. Some people are doing even greater things than what we're doing. Number two. Number three, we cannot claim 
what happened in Burkina Faso. My friend Sia spoke about that. But the people who did it, they did that in the name of Thomas Sankara. They did that in the name of Pan-Africanism. And then we know them. So the strategy is to try and be in connection with those on the ground who are doing the struggle. And then we be in Burkina and Senegal in different parts of the world. This is what we're doing. Right. That's number three. Now, number four now. I am a researcher. When I, was, I know it is difficult uh, of, you know, to do a research on Pan-Africanism and then, uh, and then be able you know, to work like in the American government. But I decided to do my research on Pan-Africanism to come with a new framework in the 21st century. It is my contribution, and then like me, there are many other people who are doing the same thing. It is part of the strategy, because in the, that battle of ideas, we should be able to tell the European that, you know, you think about the Eurocentric view of world, you think about capitalism, we too, as Africans, we claim our African value system, and this is what we are promoting, number four. Now, last to, tell, to, to finish, Nkrumah was here, certainly they asked him the same question. Oh yeah, you know, you hear doing conferences, he went to England, so what is the strategy? Nkrumah went to Ghana with the UGCC, 